So in this lecture we're going to be looking at potential energy, conservative forces and the conservation of mechanical energy. So the textbook reference for this lecture is chapter 8. So first of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas from the last lecture. In the last lecture, we saw that work done by the gravitational force on an object moving up a height h is given by minus mgh. So it's negative because the gravitational force acts down while we've said that the object is moving up. The work done by a spring with a spring constant k as it extends from xi to xf is given by minus k over 2 times xf squared minus xi squared. And finally we saw that we could calculate the work done by a general force f of x using the formula that the work is equal to the integral from the initial position to the final position of f of x dx. So, so far we've seen that kinetic energy, which is represented by K, is the energy associated with motion of a body. And work, W, is a way for a force to transfer energy from one body to another body, or from a field to a body. However, there is another common kind of energy, potential energy, which has the symbol U. This can be thought of as a stored energy. It's associated with the configuration of objects that assert forces on each other. So to calculate the potential energy, we need to calculate the work done against a field or a force. So a field is something that has a value at each point in space and time. It can be a vector or a scalar. So many forces, such as the gravitational or the electromagnetic force, can be described as fields. And we'll learn more about this later. When an applied force does work on the body overcoming a force field, then that work is stored in the body and the body can convert the work done on it back into kinetic energy. So the stored energy is called potential energy, U. So an example is lifting a ball a certain distance through a gravitational field. The energy is stored in the ball, so if we drop the ball from the height it was lifted to, it accelerates and it's then gaining kinetic energy. So it's then converting its stored potential energy back into kinetic energy. So a question, if I throw an object up in the air with a speed u at height 0, it reaches the maximum height h where it's at rest. What we can, can we say about the change in energy of the object? So the total energy has not changed as initially it has kinetic energy. Negative work is done by the gravitational forces as it moves up and the work the body does against the field is stored as potential energy. That's actually absolutely right. The gravitational force is acting down, that's true, and the object is moving up, correct. This means negative work is done on the body, correct, and so its total energy decreases. This is why it slows down. Okay, so its total energy doesn't decrease, only its kinetic energy decreases. So kinetic energy decreases. So this one's incorrect. So as the object is moving up, positive work is being done by the force pushing the object up. So that's not true because there's no force pushing the object up in this case. We've thrown it up and the only force acting upon it is the gravitational force. This is transferred to the body increasing its potential energy. So that one's incorrect. Okay, so work can transform kinetic energy to potential energy. So we've seen the work kinetic energy theorem, which is absolutely right. The change in kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, and this is equal to the work done on the body. Now, in many cases, this work transforms the energy into potential energy. So we also have the change in potential energy is equal to the final potential energy minus the in initial potential energy, and this is equal to the negative work done. So for example, when we throw a ball up, its kinetic energy is changing and its potential en energy is changing. So the negative of the work done on it is the energy stored as the potential energy. Okay, so can you think of a case when this doesn't hold? Okay, well, it doesn't hold when you're overcoming friction for example, when we do work against friction, there's nowhere for that energy to be stored. It's kind of generated as heat. If you rub your hands together, the friction generates heat. And this isn't useful stored energy, so it's not a potential energy. So this isn't always the case, but it is sometimes the case.
So this brings us to conservative and non-conservative forces. So when only conservative forces act, mechanical energy, which is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, is conserved. So the network done by a conservative force moving around a closed path is equal to zero. So for example, if we lift a ball up and then let it drop back down, the network done is zero because when we're lifting it up, we're doing negative work against gravity. When it drops back down, it's doing positive work against gravity and those two sum together and cancel each other out. So an equivalent statement is the work done by a conservative force on a particle moving between two points does not depend upon the path taken by the particle. So we can see for friction, this really isn't true. If you go around a longer path between two points, then you experience more friction than if you go along a shorter path because the work done about against friction is given by the force times the displacement. So if the displacement's longer, there's more work done against the friction. So, task. Identify each of these forces as conservative or non-conservative. So, gravitational force, close to the surface of the Earth. This one's conservative because if we lift a ball up and then the ball comes back down, no work has been done on it. If we think about taking the ball around a kind of rectangular path like this, then when it's going along the horizontal length, we're not changing its height. So there is no work done against the gravitational force along this line because the gravitational force is downwards and the displacement is leftwards. So these are perpendicular to each other. So when we do the dot product of the force with the displacement, it's zero. So we've only got these two vertical sides contributing. So this one is conservative. Okay, friction, this is non-conservative. If we imagine pushing an object from here to here, if we go directly, then there's less work done by friction than if we take it around this way with the same frictional force. So air resistance is the same as friction, non-conservative. And a spring force, so this is described by Hooke's law, this one's actually conservative. Okay, so for conservative forces, the potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done. So we can write that the change in potential energy is equal to minus the integral from the initial position to the final position of f of x dx. So we can use this to show that the gravitational potential energy is given by u is equal to mgy and that the elastic spring potential energy is given by u is equal to a half kx squared. So we'll, let's do that now, and then we'll discuss how we define our zero points in these systems. Okay, so let's use this to show the gravitational potential energy is given by this expression. Now to do this, we will need to think about our zero points. So let's define the ground down here as y equals zero, and we'll consider moving something up to a height y equals h above the ground. Now the force, the weight force that we need to overcome as we do that is mg downwards. And so we can say that the change in potential energy, which is the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. Now we're going to define the ground here as our u equals zero point. So we'll say the object has zero potential energy, gravitational potential energy, when it's at y equals zero, when its height is zero. And this is equal to using this equation, we're going from zero to height h of f of x. So in this case, the force is minus mg times dy. And so we can integrate this and we've got mg y and we evaluate that at 0 and h so this is equal to mg h. So taking the initial potential energy here as 0 this tells us that the final potential energy u is equal to mg h which is how we get this expression here. 
Now let's picture what happens with a spring. So let's have a spring with a mass on the end here. And in this diagram, the spring is at its equilibrium position. So we're going to define this as x equals zero. And then what we'll do is we'll stretch the spring. So we're moving it out to some distance x like this. And we'll calculate that the work we need to do to extend the spring this way. So to do that, we can once again say delta u is equal to u final minus u initial, which is equal to minus. Now we're going from x equals zero to x, and the force on the object is back this way. That's the spring force. So the, and it's given by minus kx, and the displacement is dx. So integrating this, we end up with kx squared on 2 from 0 to x, which is equal to kx squared on 2. So this is equal to the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. Now, if we take this initial potential energy as 0, then we've got, so this is 0, then the final potential energy is equal to kx squared on 2, where x is the extension there from the equilibrium position. So you can see it's gaining potential energy as we extend the spring. So conservation of mechanical energy, this is really important. When only conservative forces act, we've got the, the change in kinetic energy is equal to negative the change in potential. We know that because the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done, and the change in potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done. So this tells us that the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy is equal to negative the final potential energy plus the initial potential energy. So we can say that the final mechanical energy, which is the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy, is equal to the initial mechanical energy, which is the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy. So another way to say that is the total mechanical energy is conserved, the change in mechanical energy, which is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, is equal to zero. So to practice using this, homework set 2 for 1A questions 9 and 11 for higher 1A questions 11, 13, 14 and 16. So in this example, we've got a slide which is 20 metres above the ground. So let's draw a little diagram here. Here's the slide and this height is 20 metres. The slide makes an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal, so theta is equal to 45 degrees. What is the speed of the child as they slide without friction to the bottom? And what would be the child's speed if the slide was inclined as a smaller angle of 20 degrees? So to use conservation of energy for this question, we can say that the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy is equal to zero. So we can say, well, the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy plus the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy is equal to zero. Now the initial kinetic energy is zero because the child starts from rest. The final potential energy is zero because we're taking the ground as our 0 0.4 potential energy. So this tells us that the final kinetic energy is equal to the initial potential energy. So the final kinetic energy is a half mv squared, and the initial potential energy is mgh. So the m's cancel out, and we end up with v is equal to the square root of 2gh, which we can calculate. This is the square root of 2 times 9.8 times 20 which is equal to 20 meters per second. Now, this is completely independent of angle. If it was at a shallower angle, then because we haven't changed the height above ground, it would be a longer slide, but the speed at the bottom would still remain the same. So independent. Now, the reality is that if we had a longer 
slide with a shallower angle, in reality there would be some friction. So because it was a longer slide, we'd be doing more work against friction as the child went down the slide. So they'd actually end up with a slightly slower speed at the bottom than at the bottom of a really steep slide. Okay, so we've seen how we can get from the applied force to the change in potential energy, but we can actually get back the opposite way as well. So the opposite of integrating something is differentiating it. So if we differentiate the potential energy with respect to x, then we'll get the force in the x direction. Now, force is a vector, so if we wanted to get the total force in every direction, we'd also have to integrate the potential energy with respect to the y direction and also the z direction. And this would give us a vector expression for the force acting upon the body. So to practice going back the opposite way, have a go at homework set two, question eight for 1A and question 10 for higher 1A. Okay, now external forces change the energy of a system. So if we consider a system with no non-conservative forces acting, then an external force acting on the system is going to change its energy as it's doing work on the system. And we said when we do work on something, we're giving it energy. So this force, the force doing the work, transfers energy in the form of work into the system. So the network, so we could write net here if we wanted, the network done on the system by external forces is equal to the change in the potential energy plus the change in the kinetic energy, which tells us that if there are no external forces acting upon a system, then the mechanical energy must be conserved as this cannot change unless there's an external force acting upon the system. Now friction actually decreases the mechanical energy of the system because friction is a non-conservative force. So when friction acts, if you rub your hands together, friction's acting and your hands heat up. So friction actually converts the energy into thermal energy. So thermal energy is associated with random movement of atoms and molecules in a system. We'll be learning more about this in the thermal physics topic. And friction results in thermal energy. So the work done by an object against friction is given by the work done against friction is the frictional force times the distance and that is converted into thermal energy which is generally not a useful form of energy. So this has got the opposite sign of the work done by the frictional force. So the work done by the frictional force is negative, the work done against the frictional force is positive. So we can then write, if we've got an external force acting upon the body, the total work done by the external force is equal to the change in mechanical energy. So this, this work goes into mechanical energy and it can also go into thermal energy. Okay, so let's picture what's going on here. Imagine that we have a block here and we're applying some force F to it. So this applied force is an external force which is doing work on the system. So it's adding energy to the system. So this applied force is going to start the block moving, giving it some kinetic energy. We're also going to have to do some work against this frictional force here. So the supplied work goes into increasing the kinetic energy of the block and then some of it goes into overcoming this frictional force here, and so, which we've written here as the thermal energy. So the value for this one is the frictional force times the distance, where this is the force times the distance, the applied force. Okay, so I think this is really easiest to understand with an example. So let's do this example. A food chipper pushes a wood crate of cabbage heads. Okay, so here is the crate of cabbage heads, which has a mass of 14 kilograms, across a concrete floor with a horizontal force F. Okay, so here's the horizontal force F here. 
which has magnitude of 40 newtons. So F is equal to 40 newtons. In a straight line displacement of magnitude 0.5 meters, okay, so the distance it travels is 0 0.50 meters, the speed of the crate decreases from an initial speed of 0 0.60 meters per second to a final speed of 0 0.20 meters per second. And part A says how much work is done by the force F and on which, which system does it do the work? Okay, well F is pushing the crate, so it's doing the work on the crate. And to calculate the work done, we just need to use our equation F dot D. And we've been told D and we've been told F. So this is just 40 times 0 0.50, which is equal to 20 joules. Now part B, what is the increase in thermal energy of the crate and the floor? So we know that if there's an external force doing work, such as this one, then that goes into changing the mechanical energy plus changing the thermal energy. So the mechanical energy is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. Now there is no change in potential energy here. The crate is not being lifted up or moved down. It's always at the same gravitational potential and there's no other way that we can store energy in this particular system. So this part is zero. So it's just the change in kinetic energy. And then we've got the change in the thermal energy. So we can rearrange this and say, well, the change in the thermal energy is equal to the work done minus the change in the kinetic energy. So we've calculated the work done, it's 20 joules, and then the change in the kinetic energy, that's a half mv final squared minus a half mv initial squared. So we can write this as 20 minus a half times m, I'm pulling the half and m out as common factors, and then I've got my final velocity squared, which is 0 0.20, and I've got my initial velocity squared, so 0 0.60 squared. And so solving this, I end up with 22 joules. So it's gaining 22 joules of thermal energy. So part C then asks, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the crate and the floor? So this 22 joules goes into work overcoming that frictional force. So I've got that my thermal energy is equal to my frictional force times the distance, and that's equal to mu k times mg times d. So I can rearrange this and say, well, mu k is equal to the change in thermal energy divided by MGD, which is equal to the 22 joules divided by 14 times 9.8 times 0 0.5, which is equal to 0 0.32. Okay, so this brings us to the conservation of energy, which is a very, very powerful idea in physics. So we can say that the total energy E of a system can change only by amounts of energy that are transferred to or from the system. I mean, that makes sense. If you want to change the energy in a system, you have to give it energy or take it energy, take energy away. And the only way that we've learned about so far to transfer energy to a system is by doing work on it. So when we do work on the system, so this is an external force doing work on the system, then the change of energy of the system is equal to the change in mechanical energy of the system plus the change in thermal energy of the system. So that's um, things like work done against friction plus the change in the internal energy of the system, which we will learn more about in the thermal topic. So this is ways that the system has of internally storing energy. So we can say that the total energy of an isolated system, so an isolated system is one on which no external forces is acting, cannot change because this work done is zero. So zero is equal to the change in the mechanical energy plus the change in the thermal energy plus the change in the internal energy. So this is the law of conservation of energy.
Okay, so this is the same problem that we saw at the end of the last lecture, but possibly we'll do it in a slightly easier way this time. So we've got a block with mass m, which is at the top of the slope. It's released with an initial speed vi, at, and the plane is at an angle theta. There's a coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the plane of mu k, and after sliding a distance d down the plane, so it slides this distance d, Till it's up against this spring, the block collides with the spring, with spring constant k, and compresses it a distance x. Okay, so this then compresses a distance x. So part one says, taking u equals zero is the gravitational potential energy of the block when the spring is fully compressed. Write an expression for u initial, the potential energy of the block at the top of the slope. Okay, so we know that the potential energy is given by mgh. So all we need to do is work out, well, how high is the block at the top of the slope? So we want the distance between there and here. So this is h, and this angle in here is theta, and it's slid down the distance x plus d. So we can say, well, sine theta is equal to opposite, which is h, over the hypotenuse, which is x plus d. So this tells us that h is equal to x plus d sine theta. So we can write, well, u is equal to mg x plus d sine theta. Now part two says write an expression for the potential energy of the spring when it is fully compressed. So if we take the initial potential energy of the spring when it's at equilibrium as zero, then we know that the potential energy of the spring is given by a half kx squared. So that's the potential energy when it is fully compressed a uh, distance x. Okay, so part three asks us to calculate how much energy has been lost to friction as the block slid down the slope to its lowest point. Okay, so to work this out, we'll need to work out the work done against friction, which is the frictional force times the distance that it slid. Now the total distance it slid is equal to d plus x. So this will be d plus x. And the frictional force that's given by mu k times the normal force times d plus x, and the normal force in this case is equal to mg cos theta. So this is equal to mu k times mg cos theta times d plus x. So we can see it's mg cos theta by considering the forces perpendicular to the plane, and perpendicular to the plane, we've got the normal force up, we've got the weight force down, and so perpendicular to the plane, these two must balance. If this is theta here, then we've got mg cos theta. So the normal force and mg cos theta must cancel each other out or it would accelerate up off the plane. There is a frictional force, but it's parallel to the plane, so it doesn't contribute here. And so this is the amount of energy which is lost to friction by the block. Okay, so... Part four asks us to calculate the initial speed of the block in terms of other variables in the question. So to do this, I think it's easiest to consider the energy changes between the initial state up here and the final state down here. So at the end, it's got some final kinetic energy plus some final potential energy. And at the start, it had some initial kinetic energy plus some initial potential energy. And then on its way down, it lost some of this energy overcoming friction. So we'll write that as minus W, where this is the work done against friction. So against friction. So this, there's no external forces in this case. And so we can write the final kinetic energy. Well, once this spring is fully compressed, we know that it is at rest. So this is zero. Now, the final potential energy, there's two forms of potential energy in this question. There is the gravitational potential energy and the spring potential energy. And we're saying at the bottom, it has no gravitational potential energy, but the spring is compressed. So there is potential energy in the spring. So this is given by a half kx squared. 
Now the initial kinetic energy, we know that it's moving with speed v initial at the start. So this is a half mv initial squared. Now potential energy. At the start, the spring is not compressed, so there is no potential energy stored in the spring. However, there is potential energy from the gravitational force. So we calculated that in part one. So we've got plus mg x plus d sine theta here. And then we lose energy against friction. So that's calculated here, minus mu k mg cos theta times d plus x. So we're trying to work out the initial speed here. So we'll move everything else over to the other side. We're going to multiply everything through by 2. So I'll put a factor of 2 there and a factor of 2 there and cancel off my factors of a half. And now I'm, I am going to divide by m because I want to get rid of my m from my initial velocity here. So that gets rid of that m, that m. This term is over m and we get rid of this m as well. Okay, so my initial velocity squared is equal to kx squared on m minus 2gx plus d sine theta plus 2 mu kg cos theta x plus d. And then to find the initial velocity, I just need to take the square root of that. So rather than writing this out again, I am now going to proceed to take the square root of that. And this is in fact exactly the same term as we came up with in the problem at the end of lecture 9, but I think that this way was a lot easier. There was a lot less working to get it this way. So in this problem, a small block with a mass of 0 0.20 kilograms slides along the frictionless track shown. So it starts from height capital H, which is equal to 1.3 meters, traveling at U, which is equal to 1.0 meters per second. The end of the track is 0 0.40 meters above the lowest point. And there it's rough. So here's the rough bit of the track with a coefficient of kinetic friction being equal to 0 0.3. And part one asks, what is the speed of the block at its lowest point? So we're being asked to find the speed of the block here. So let's consider the energy changes between here and here, where there's this is a frictionless part of the track. Frictionless. Okay, so we can say, well, the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. Now, down here at this final position, it has got no potential energy. We're taking this as our zero point for potential energy. So if we want to find the speed at this point, we can say, well, a half mv squared is equal to the initial kinetic energy, which is a half mu squared, plus the initial potential energy, which is equal to mgh, because capital H there is the distance above this zero point. So the m's will actually cancel out and we can multiply through by 2 and we end up with v taking the square root is equal to the square root of u squared plus 2gh which we can substitute into this is the square root of 1 squared plus 2 times 9.8 times 1.3 and solving this I end up with 5.1 meters per second and that's to two significant figures. Now part two says how far does the block travel along the rough part of the track? Okay, so basically what happens is it has some initial energy and then it's losing that initial energy as work done against friction. So we can say that the final potential kinetic energy plus the final potential energy is equal to the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy minus the work done against friction. So this is the energy that it's losing as it travels over this part of the track. Now the initial position that we'll consider is this one. So this is initial and the final position we're considering is when it stopped. So it's somewhere over here. So we can say that the final kinetic energy is zero because it's come to rest. 
So let's substitute in what we know to this equation. So we can work out the final potential energy here. We've got mg little h, and we've got our initial kinetic energy over here. That's a half m u squared, and the initial potential energy is given by mgh. And then it's losing this energy as work done against friction, which is mu k times the normal force times the distance that it travels. And it's this d that we're trying to work out. Now, it's just a block on a flat surface. So the normal force is balanced by the weight force. So this normal force we can replace with mg. Now, we can cancel out all the m's. And we're trying to find how far it travels. So we're trying to find D. So let's rearrange this and we can write mu k g D is equal to a half u squared plus G capital H minus G little h. So to rearrange for D, we've got a half u squared plus G. And then this is H minus H divided by the mu k G. Now that's fully simplified, so now we can substitute in our values. So we've got a half times 1 squared plus 9.8 times 1.3 minus 0 0.40 divided by 0 0.30 times 9.8. And solving that, we end up with 3.2 meters. So that's how far it travels along the rough part of the track. Okay, so in this problem, we have a click beetle that's upside down on its back and it jumps upwards by suddenly arching its back, transferring energy stored in muscles to mechanical energy. So we're converting potential energy in the muscles into mechanical energy. This launch mechanism produces an audible click, giving the beetle its name. So video tape of a certain click beetle shows that the beetle with a mass of four point zero times 10 to the minus six kilogram moves directly upwards by 0.3 millimeters during launch. Okay, so while it's launching, the beetle is pushing down on the floor and the floor is pushing up on the beetle. And these two forces are equal and opposite according to Newton's third law. But this is the force which is going to launch the beetle into the air. Once it's in the air, this force is no longer acting. And then we have to calculate the maximum, well, we're told that the maximum height the beetle launches to is 0.3 meters. And we're asked during the launch, what are the average magnitudes of part one, the external force on the beetle's back from the floor? Okay, so the energy which is being converted into the mechanical energy, which allows the beetle to move up to a certain height. So let's draw, here it is, it's, final height is equal to 0 0.30 meters and at this height it's got no speed but during the launch this normal force is doing work on it which is adding that energy to the system so we can say that the work is equal to the change in the mechanical energy which is equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the final energy so initially, before this all starts, the beetle is at rest on the floor. So we've got no potential energy and we've got no kinetic energy. And then at the end, it's launched itself up to this maximum speed, uh, maximum height. It's got no speed, but it does have a potential energy. So we can say, well, this is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy plus the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy, which is equal to zero minus zero, because it doesn't have any kinetic energy here and it doesn't have any kinetic energy up here, but it does have a final potential energy. So that's MGH and it's got no initial potential energy. So we can say that the work done, so we can say that the work done by the force launching the beetle is equal to MGH. But we can also say something else about the work because we know that work is equal to force times distance. So we can put this as the force done, so the external force on the beetle's back from the floor, that's the normal force times the distance. And so we can say, well, the force is equal to mgh divided by 
the distance. And this is what we've been asked to calculate. So we can now substitute everything into here because we've got the mass is 4 times 10 to the minus 6. G, that's 9.8. The height it rises to is 0.3 meters. And the distance over which this external force is applied is a 0 0.77 millimeters. So that's 0 0.77 times 10 to the minus 3. So solving this on the calculator, we get 0 0.015 newtons, and that's upwards. Because it's this normal force here which is launching it. Okay, so that was part one. Part two then asks us for the acceleration of the beetle in terms of g. So we're trying to work out the acceleration as it launches. So we can use Newton's second law, f is equal to ma, which tells us that a is equal to f on m. So that's 0 0.015 divided by 4 times 10 to the minus 6, which is equal to 3.8 times 10 to the 3 meters per second per second. But it asks us in terms of g, so we just divide by g to give it in terms of g. So a is equal to 3.8 times 10 to the 3 over 9.8 g, which is because we can see why this is. If we have g divided by 9.8, that's 1. We can multiply anything by 1, and it's not changed. So solving this, we get 390 g as the acceleration of the beetle as it's launching itself. So quite a high acceleration.